We all love shotguns. Oddly, they haven't changed much over the years, at least compared to other firearms. What works just works, right? Well, that doesn't mean that things never got a little crazy. So today, we are going to look at some of the crazy shotguns ever developed. Let's jump right in. Number 9. Remington 7188 Firefights in Vietnam seem to be rather varied. Like most places wars are fought, Vietnam offered a diverse environment. But some parts of the country offered nothing but dense, brutal jungle. Thus, plenty of fights were at close range, and shotguns had an advantage. Shotguns could dominate in close-range power, and the fact they fired multiple projectiles at a time increased their hit potentials and made them easier to use against moving targets in close quarters. The shotguns at the time, however, just weren't up for the job in the sweltering jungles of Vietnam. Thus, the Remington 7188 was born. Of all the crazy shotguns on today's list, the Remington 7188 is the most normal. It looks so unassuming with its wood furniture and simple design, almost like the shotgun your dad kept hanging above the door in his study. In fact, it is essentially just your standard Remington 1100 with some slight modifications. Simple things like an extended mag tube, a bayonet mount, a barrel shroud, and the ability to fire fully auto. That's right, the Remington 7188 utilized a select fire mode to go from semi-auto to full auto with the flip of a switch. A 12-gauge shotgun seems pretty dang hard to handle in full auto, but the rate of fire was rather slow and controllable. It held only 8 rounds, so it emptied quickly. This gun allowed a commando to blast away with a ton of shots in mere seconds. Sadly, even this gun wasn't always reliable, especially in the unforgiving jungles of Vietnam. Number 8. The Special Operations Weapon Carol Childers worked at the Naval Special Warfare Center in Virginia and helped develop a ton of weapons for America's elite warfighters. The Special Operations Weapon, or SOW, wasn't a mainstream project. He got a little money here and there and was a one-man crew designing it around time spent on other projects. The SOW is really what started the idea of crazy shotguns that continues throughout the rest of this video. Childers had developed a mag-fed Remington 870, so he took the mag from the 870 and fitted it to the SOW. The SOW ended up being a full-auto shotgun designed to be fired from the hip like an action star from the 80s. The weapon featured two pistol grips and utilized a top-loading mag. The mag held 20 rounds of 12-gauge and almost tripled the firepower of the Remington 7188. The SOW utilized a very controllable 200 rounds per minute firing rate. That's slow enough to easily fire a round at a time. The full-auto action still allowed the user to blast away through the jungle at opposing forces. Sadly, this is one of the many crazy shotguns which never made it much further than the prototype stage. Number 7. AA-12 According to the classic American film The Expendables, the AA-12 delivers. Of all the crazy shotguns we have for you, the AA-12 made it to the furthest in development. In fact, people are still kicking the gun around trying to get a contract. Like all the previous crazy shotguns, the AA-12 offered shooters a select fire option. The design started in the 1970s, and over time the weapon adapted and developed into a modern shotgun that would make the M16 proud. A liberal use of polymer in the weapon construction and a unique forced gas-operated API blowback system kept both weight and recoil in check. The weapon fired from an open bolt to ensure both a lack of cook-offs and that plastic hulls wouldn't melt in the chamber. A firing rate of 300 rounds per minute kept things controllable but quick and the mag-fed action allowed it to be quickly reloaded. Mag capacities ranged from 8-round box mags to 20 and 32-round drums. A variety of ammunition was produced for the gun, including frag rounds which promised mini-grenades which could potentially make these fully automatic mini-grenade launchers. No wonder Adrian Brody used one to fight the Predator. Number 6. HK Cause In the 1980s, the military was actively looking for crazy shotguns for a program called the Close Aslot Weapon System, aka the Cause, which would use 12-gauge ammunition that would not be compatible with commercial 12-gauge. The Cause program spat out two different shotguns. The first we'll mention is HK's own Cause. The HK Cause took the shotgun to a bullpup layout that was mag-fed. As required, the weapon used a 10-round box mag of 12-gauge ammo that was 76 millimeters long. Olin developed a 3-inch shotgun shell for the cause that was belted brass, each containing 8 tungsten pellets. These pellets could penetrate 1.5 millimeters of steel plate, which is pretty impressive for a shotgun. 
The shells could also load standard buckshot and flechettes in case the user needed to punch a big hole in something. HK equipped their cause entry with selective fire capability, and the weapon used a recoil-operated design with a self-regulated gas assist. This means the barrel moved with the bolt for a short period as the weapon cycled, and gas could help with the recoil operation. This neat futuristic design didn't go beyond the cause program. Number 5. AAI Cause AAI is the king of weird weapons, especially during Vietnam and the latter half of the Cold War. AAI designed tools like the famed M203 grenade launcher that would mount beneath the barrel of a rifle, so it wasn't all crazy shotguns and suppressors. In fact, the AAI cause was a fairly conservative approach to the cause shotgun concept. AAI's entry used a standard layout with an M16 stock and pistol grip with a 12-round mag. The weapon utilized a recoil-operated system with a selective fire option. The weapon used a fancy load AAI christened scimitar, a proprietary 12-gauge round designed for their entry. The shot shell utilized a series of flechettes that reportedly created devastating wound channels and lent their cause a longer effective overall range than traditional shotguns. These flechettes are brutal at close range and fin stabilized for a greater overall range. The AAI cause could cut through 3 mm of low carbon steel. Not bad at all for a scatter gun. The AAI cause's specialized and proprietary shotgun shell was slightly shorter than most standard shotgun shells, so the mags could be shorter and easier to handle. Sadly, the AAI cause disappeared with the cause project. Number 4. Boito Double Kmart, as of last spring, still operated three stores in the US, but not that long ago, there were 2,000 Kmarts from coast to coast. If you're too young to remember Kmart, think of it as a cheaper Walmart. Kmart had a gimmick, the blue light special, a flashing blue light set in an aisle so you knew something was on sale. Blue light special became a punchline for anything cheap and shoddy, and the term applied in spades to the Boito doubles. In the early 80s, Kmart imported the shotguns from Brazil. They were crudely finished, made of soft steel, and many of them didn't work very well. They also had Kmart stamped on the barrel, which was not the flex Kmart thought it was. There were both doubles and side-by-sides. The Boido's sole virtue was that it was cheap, although fortunately, not cheap enough for our dad to buy us one on impulse. If he had, and we had kept it pristine all these years, and it hadn't broken yet, it would be worth $175 today, some 40 years later. Number 3. Winchester Model 11 SL Unlike many genius inventors, John Browning was also pretty sharp on the business side. When he invented the Auto 5 shotgun 120 years ago, he patented everything he could think of, including the charging handle. T.C. Johnson, Winchester's in-house genius and inventor of the Model 12, was tasked with the nearly impossible job of designing a semi-auto that didn't infringe on Browning's patents. Since he couldn't put a charging handle on the gun, Johnson put a knurled section on the barrel. To open the gun, you set the butt on the ground, held the barrel, and pushed down. Tragically, for several Model 11 SL owners, paper shells of the time often got wet and swelled up and stuck in the chamber. If you tried to clear the stuck shell by setting the butt of your Winchester semi-auto on the ground and pushing as hard as you could on the barrel, it could slam fire. And if you had your head over the barrel at the time, you shot yourself in the face. It happened often enough that the Model 11 SL earned the nickname Widowmaker. While that was its fatal flaw, the Model 11 SL had others, like fiber buffers in place of Browning's metal friction rings. The buffers would wear out, the gun would kick extra hard, and stocks would split. Given that it actually took the life of its owners, the Model 11 SL is probably the worst shotgun of all time. Number 2. Saltwood Brownings Who would want a gun that rusts from the inside out? If you were unlucky, that's exactly what you could buy from Browning in the 60s and 70s. Most of the called saltwood Brownings were superposed, but some T-Bolts, Safari, Olympian and Medallion grade rifles, and some commemorative 2 millionth edition Auto 5s were also stocked with saltwood. Gunstock wood had to be dried, a process that takes several months. In the 1960s, demand for Browning guns was high and the company had just scored large amounts of California walnut. California walnut is prone to crack if it's kiln dried quickly so Browning looked to Morton Salt for a solution. Morton had come up with a salt drying process for the furniture industry that cut drying time dramatically and worked very well. Browning bought it. 
What could possibly go wrong if you put salted wood onto steel gun parts? Plenty, it turns out. The wood was stacked in an area about the size of a football field, and salt was applied. The process drew moisture from the wood very effectively, but in doing so, it created a brine solution that dripped down and soaked the bottom planks in the pile. Once the brined wood was made into stocks and forends and fitted onto steel frames, the guns started rusting. Often you couldn't tell by looking at the outside of the gun as the rust would start where the stock headed up against the middle. The saltwood era lasted from 1966 to the 1970s. To its credit, Browning owned up to the problem and would replace saltwood stocks, but it would have been better if they had never put those stocks on guns to begin with. Number 1. Remington CTI-105 Eager to regain the spot at the top of the gas gun heap that Remington had owned for so long with the 1100, the company asked its engineers to think way outside the box in the double O's. They did, and it came up with the CTI-105. It had a receiver partly made of titanium, a carbon fiber rib, and an unusual bottom eject design, which we don't believe has been made on a semi-auto shotgun before or since, perhaps with good reason. The CTI-105 had a lot of pluses. It was soft shooting. It didn't fling shells at the person next to you. We had one and could shoot it quite well. It was good-looking and well-balanced. Remington Function tested the gun extensively, firing thousands of rounds through early versions. Unfortunately, they forgot to test the guns with the cheap Winchester Walmart loads sold in 100 packs that were probably the most popular shot shells in the country at the time. The shells caused problems in other guns too, but the otherwise nifty CTI-105 would bend them in the middle instead of lifting them up in the chamber when the gun cycled. If your gun won't shoot the shells that America shoots, it's a pretty tough sell. Remington tried to fix the gun's failings with the CTI-105 too and couldn't. The CTI-105 went away and Remington went back to making 1100s and 1187s before trying again with the much better Versamax. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.